Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Players at the Chess by Sebastian Evans, as published in Short Stories magazine in 1891. The story is formal and strange and thought-provoking and has a fantastic twist. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. King Solomon ben David, the wise, on whom be peace, was a mighty player at the chess before the Lord. And he sent unto Vaphres, king of Egypt, and Nabonassar, king of Babylon, and Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and unto others of the kings round about, whether they were friends or whether they were enemies, Hadad, king of Edom, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Rezon, king of Damascus, who alone of the princes of Syria refused to bend the knee to the king of Israel, saying, Greeting from my lord Solomon, king of Israel, who desireth to play with thee at the chess. And whomsoever among ye is minded to play with me at the chess, either I will come unto him, or otherwise, if he shall, he shall come to me at the house of Milo in Jerusalem. And if he win of me a game, he shall have ten of the cities of Israel, of them that are nighest his own borders. But, and if he lose, he shall forfeit me ten cities of those of his own country, that are nighest the land of Israel. And King Vaphres, which is Pharaoh, and the other kings, played with King Solomon, and the Lord gave King Solomon the upper hand of them all, so that he got fifty walled cities beyond the borders of Israel, and made broad the borders of Israel from the river Euphrates unto the land of Egypt, so that he ruled all the kingdoms, as it is written, even from Tipshah unto Uzzah. And it came to pass after a time that there was no man so bold that he durst adventure to play King Solomon at the chess unless he should give him the advantage, as three of the foot soldiers, or an elephant, or a camel of the right hand, and a knight of the left, or the like. And all of his viziers, and all the poets and musicians of the temple, he made a weary of their lives because of disappointment. For he would say, Oh, such and such a one, do thou play me at the chess, and I will give thee three or four, as it might be, of my fighting men, and if thou win the game of me, I will give thee a garment of broidered work of hind, worth a thousand pieces of gold, or a sword of the steel of Cathay, with a hilt wrought of a single emerald, such as no king hath in his treasury, or a charger of the colts of the dams of Arabia by the steeds of the sea." So they played at the chess with the king, and when he had won the game of any of them, then would he laugh and say, Behold, I leave thee thy robe, for it is not meet for a king to take aught of his servants. And he bade them fill him wine, that he might forget the bitterness of his heart. But after a time it came to pass that the king was weary of playing with his viziers and the poets and musicians of the temple and his judges and the captains of his guard and would fain find out others whose manners of play he knew not to play against him at the chess. But the dread of the king was sore in the hearts of them that he called to play against him, and he said, Behold, they are all daunted by the terror of my wisdom, and I have no glory of all my skill. For though the gazelle be fleeter of foot than the leopard, yet ever the leopard leapeth on to the neck of the gazelle. Now, therefore, will I disguise me, and they that play against me shall not know that they play against King Solomon. So he called unto him his chief vizier, Zabud ben Na, the king's friend, and at eventide they stained their faces and put on garments as they had been merchants from Ophir, and went forth into the streets of the city. And at the corner of the king's avenue, which is before the house of Milo, they met a stranger clad in a rich garment of Baalbek, walking slowly as one perplexed, not lifting his eyes from the ground. And Solomon said, Peace be upon thee, O brother. And the stranger answered, Peace be upon thee, O brother, from the Lord of peace, the one, the merciful. And Solomon said, 
Who art thou, and whither goest thou? For me seemeth thou art a stranger in the city. And the stranger said, Men call me Jerob ben Othniel, and Vafris, king of Egypt, this long time hath entertained me in his palace as one of his boon companions, for I am a poet and a musician after his own heart. And even now am I come into Jerusalem as a messenger under Jehoshaphat ben Abiud, King Solomon's remembrancer, with whom I must needs be before midnight. Then said Solomon, It wanteth yet some hours of midnight. Come with us in the meanwhile to our lodging, and let us pass the time with wine and music. I will well, said Jerab. And when they came into the lodging King Solomon had prepared, Zabud let call for wine, and they made merry. Then said King Solomon, Let bring the tables, that thou and I may play about at the chess, and then shalt thou sing us a song of them that delight the heart of King Pharaoh. Then Jareb said, Sweet is the song that closeth the eyes in sleep, and giveth ease to the sick man who crieth aloud for soreness of his pain. When he heareth my voice, the slave remembereth not his chain, nor the outcast his poverty. The toiler layeth aside his work, and the angry man his wrath. But, as for playing at the chess at this time, I pray thee hold thy servant excused, for the one merciful, to whom be glory, hath laid a burden on thy servant, so that he cannot lose a game at the chess, even if he so would. And haply, if he win a game of thee, thou wilt be angered, and he should seem ungrateful in thine eyes for this grace thou hast shown him. Then Solomon laughed and spake within himself, This minstrel is of the children of Eblis, the braggart, and the Lord hath given him unto my hands that I may put his boasting to shame. Surely I shall win a game of him and pull his robe over his head, and then shall be given him a lute wherewith to comfort the sadness of his spirit. But the king's lips spake otherwise than the thought that was in his heart, and he said, Blessed be thou, Jerob ben Othniel. I would fain lose a game unto thee, and behold, I give thee this cloak of mine own in earnest of thy victory. And therewithal he set upon him his cloak, which was of the stuff of Tyre, with lynx's fur, worth a hundred pieces of gold. Then Zabud let call for tables, and King Solomon played at the chess with Jerob ben Othniel, and King Solomon's men were of the white, and Jerob's of the black. And Jerob played without thought, as one that cared but little of the chess, so that in a brief space King Solomon had taken prisoner both his elephants, and a knight, and a camel, besides four of his foot soldiers, while Jerob had taken but one foot soldier of King Solomon. And Solomon said within himself, There is no glory in playing with a foolish lutenist such as this. Shall Leviathan put forth his strength against the gadfly? I will contrive a combination and make an end of him. So he made a combination and took his captain. Then Jerob rose up and made as though he would go. And Solomon said unto him, Whither away? For the game is not yet played out. Then Jerob said, O oh, my lord King Solomon, when thou walkest abroad, the herbs of the field, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop on the wall, find themselves a tongue to tell thee of their several virtues. Yet hast thou not heard the voice of these chessmen? See now, and behold, if thy servant should move yonder foot soldier on to the next square, where would my lord the king be then? And Solomon looked at the tables, and behold, if his adversary should play his foot soldier onto the next square, the king was checkmated without redress. And when he understood that his name was known of Jerob, and that he was defeated, a mighty wrath got hold of King Solomon, and the world was straightened upon him, and the blackness of the tempest was in his forehead, and his voice was as the thunder in the hills, and he drew his sword and smote off the head of Jerob as he stood. Then said he to Zabud, Cast me this dog's carrion into the ditch without the city, that the fowls of uncleanliness may feast themselves therewithal. But behold, there was no dead body, neither any blood, and Zabud said, 
May God, to whom be glory, preserve my lord the king. Verily, this man was a sorcerer. Nay, said King Solomon, he was no sorcerer, for always the jewel of my girdle warneth me so often as one who useth witchcraft cometh into my presence, yet at this time it speak not. But said he not that he was bound under the house of Jehoshaphat, our remembrancer? Haste thee thither, and bring tidings whether thou hear of him. So Zabud went to the house of Jehoshaphat, and asked at the gate whether such a one had been there. And the master of the gate made answer, and said, O oh my lord, of a truth such a one hath been here, but even now. And he went in unto my lord, and even as he bowed his head to salute him, my lord groaned thrice and gave up the ghost. So Zabud returned to King Solomon and told him all the tidings. And King Solomon rent his garments for the death of Jehoshaphat and said, See now, this dog hath told me I know less than not, yet knew he less than not himself, otherwise never would he have thought to bear a message to a dead man. May God not have mercy on his soul. Now, it was about a seven years' space, and King Solomon again disguised his countenance and went forth with his chief vizier to seek one to play at the chess with the king. And, as they walked along the covered way of the thousand fountains that leadeth to the house of Lebanon, at the corner of the street called Yellow, there met them a damsel, as it were a moon, and her countenance was as a treasure-house of the beauty of the elements. Her hair was as golden as the flames in the circle of fire that is the uttermost girdle of the world. Her eyebrows were as rainbows, and her eyes as the stars of the air. Her nose and cheeks were as flowers of the earth, white and red as roses in the rose gardens of Sharon, and the mole thereon of the color of the soil of Eden. Her lips were as the coral of the seven seas, and her teeth as pearls of the waters of El Kerker. Her garments were as the milky way for the glitter of jewels, and as the nest of the phoenix for sweet smell of musk and myrrh and frankincense, and the swaying of her body as she walked was as the bending of the willow withies on the banks of Jordan when the wind of sundown reveals the inward whiteness of their leaves." And King Solomon's eyes waxed swollen for gladness to look upon her, and he said, Peace be unto thee, O daughter of mine uncle. And she answered, Peace be unto thee, my lord, and the mercy of the one merciful. And Solomon said, O damsel, who art thou, and whither goest thou? And she said, Thy servant is a slave girl of the house of Ahimaaz, to whom thy lord and mind, King Solomon, on whom be peace, hath given his daughter Basmath in marriage. And even now am I bound to the house of Bin Abinadab, to whom our lord King Solomon hath given his daughter Taphath in marriage, for there is a feast there toward this night, and thy slave hath been sent for to sing, and men call me Admatha, the daughter of Adiah. And the king said, What songs canst thou sing? And she said, O oh, my lord, thy slave girl hath but little skill, and her voice to the many soundeth harsh and untunable. Yet the lover, when he swooneth in the extremity of his passion, is fain to hearken unto me, and my song is blessed of the wise, to whom the vanity of all things hath been revealed. And Solomon said, O oh, Admatha, it is not yet the hour of the feast. Come with us a while to our lodging that we have prepared, and let us pass the time with wine and music, until it behoveth thee to depart. And she answered, Peace be upon ye, I will well. So they came into the lodging, and Zabud let call for wine, and they made merry. Then King Solomon said, let bring tables, that thou and I may play about at the chess, and then shalt thou sing us a song to the lover in the torment of his passion. But Adamatha said, O oh, my lord, as for playing the chess at this time, I pray thee hold thy slave excused. Wherefore so? exclaimed King Solomon, for my heart is set to play with thee at the chess. 
Then said Admatha, O my lord, the one merciful, to whom be all glory, hath laid a burden on thy slave. For as much as she may in no wise lose a game at the chess, strive she ever so sore. And if she play with thee and win her game, thou wilt haply be angered with her, and she should seem ungrateful to thee for this grace that thou hast shown her. And Solomon said within himself, I have held converse with this damsel aforetime, for of a surety do I remember this word she hath spoken, that none may have the upper hand of her at the chess. And he looked upon her straightly for a long time, yet he could call nothing to mind as of her face or favor. And he said within himself, Behold, that which is, that which hath been, and that which shall be, shall be even as that which is. Belike it was one of them that I have defeated of old, who boasted himself thus. But he spake with his lips, and said, O oh, Admatha, even to lose a game at thy hands were sweeter than to overcome the king of Damascus, and, behold, I give thee this cloak in earnest of thy victory. Then Zabud let call for tables, and Solomon the king played at the chess with Admatha the slave girl, and Solomon's men were of the white, and Admatha's men of the black. And Admatha played without thought, as one that cared but little of the chess, so that in a brief space King Solomon had taken prisoner both her elephants, and a knight of the right hand, and a camel of the left, besides four of her foot soldiers, while Admatha had taken but one foot soldier of the King Solomon. And Solomon said within himself, What glory is it unto me to win the chess of this music girl? Shall I lift a scimitar of the steel of Cathay to crop a flower of the balsam? I will contrive a combination and make an end of her. So he made a combination and took her captive. Then Admatha rose up and made as though she would go. But Solomon said, Whither away, O Admatha, for the game is not yet played out. Then Admatha turned about and said, O oh, my lord, King Solomon, when it listeth thee to sit on thy carpet, the winds become thy chariot, and all the beasts of the field fare under thee to subdue thine enemies, and the fowls of the air fly overhead to shield thee from the sun. Yet these chessmen, that are but of ebony wood and the tusk of behemoth, refuse to obey thee. See now, and behold, if thy slave should move yonder foot soldier on to the next square, where would my lord the king be then? As for playing at chess, thy slave girl knoweth not, yet knoweth she more withal than my lord King Solomon. And when Solomon looked at the tables, behold, if his adversary should move the foot soldier on to the next square, the king was checkmated without redress. And when he understood that he was known of Adamatha, and that he was defeated, a mighty wrath got hold upon King Solomon, and the world was straightened upon him. The vein of fury stood out between his eyebrows, and the fire flashed from his eyes as the blaze leaps from a burning mountain, and the darkness which gathered on his brow was as the smoke thereof, and his words rolled forth even as the molten stone from the mouth of the cauldrons of Eblis in the hills of Sichel, and he drew his sword and smote on off the head of Admatha as she stood. And he cried aloud to Zabud, Cast me this swine's carcass into the ditch without the city, that the fowls of uncleanliness may feast themselves therewithal. But behold, there was no dead body, neither was there any blood, and Zabud said, God preserve my lord the king, this damsel was a sorceress. Nay, said King Solomon, for my ring spake no word of warning. But said she not that she was bound to the feast at the house of Ben Abinadab? Now, therefore, go straightway thither and bring me tidings. And as Zabud went toward the house, he met a great company of men and women weeping and wailing and rending their garments. And when they saw Zabud, they cried, O oh, my lord, mayest thou survive my lord Ben Abinadab? For, behold, as we were all feasting and making merry, a certain slave girl came into the company, whom my lord bade sing to her lute. And when she had tuned her lute, she began to sing, and before ever she had sung two words, my lord turned his face to the wall and died. 
Now, therefore, bear the tidings to King Solomon with haste, for our lady Tophath, the widow of ben Abinadab, is a daughter of my lord the king. Then Solomon was sore troubled, and rent his garments, and cast ashes upon his head, and the days were darkened upon him. And he said, Who is this slave girl? For of a surety do I remember all these things of aforetime. Howbeit he remembered not Jerob ben Othniel, and he said, I am as one that resteth on his oar, when the image of his oar is bent awry by reason of the water that is over it, so that he seeth not aright that which he seemeth to see. Oh, the waters, the waters, they have covered the whole world, so that no man seeth truly the things that have been for the waters that are above them. And about a space of one and twenty years, Yet once more King Solomon and his chief vizier disguised themselves and went forth into the city, if haply they might find one to play at the chess with the king. And as they came nigh unto the water gate of the temple, behold, there stood at the bottom of the steps an old man, as it were a sheik of the sons of the desert, and his hair was white as the water courses of the hills in winter, and his beard flowed down to his knees, as it were icicles of stone in the caverns of Hermon, and his eyebrows were as the snow in the branches of the cedars of the forest, and his eyes as the torches of them that seek for Thammuz on Lebanon. And Solomon said unto him, Peace be unto thee, O mine uncle. And the old man answered, Peace be unto thee, and mercy from the one merciful. And Solomon said, By what name shall I speak to my father's brother, and wherewithal shall we bear him company? And the old man said, I am Habakkuk ben Methusael, the chief of the Benu Methusael, children of the great desert, and I have come hither to Jerusalem that I may play a game at the chess with my lord King Solomon. And Solomon said, O oh, Habakkuk, is there any of the sons of the desert who is the equal of my lord King Solomon? And Habakkuk said, Nay, my son. There is none among the kings of the earth who may be compared with my lord King Solomon in riches, or in majesty, or in wisdom. Yet haply in this matter of playing at the chess, the Lord, to whom be all the glory, hath been minded not to lay up the whole of his treasure in a single treasure house. For thy servant hath played with men of understanding, as well as with others, these two hundred years and more, yet hath he never lost a game to any of the children of men. And Solomon said within himself, Now will I win a game of this patriarch of the desert, and afterward we will bring him to the palace, and when he seeth that it was none other than King Solomon himself who hath defeated him, his shame shall be the less. So he spake to the old man and said, Behold, as at this time my lord King Solomon hath gone to sup with the daughter of Pharaoh in the house of Lebanon, and of a surety he will not return till after midnight, for thy servants but even now met the bearers returning with his litter. Wherefore do thou come with us to our lodging, and, if it irk thee not, win a game at the chess of thy servant? And Habakkuk said, I will well. So they came into the lodging, and Zabud let call for wine, and they made merry. Howbeit Habakkuk excused himself as for drinking of the wine, for that he was of a kindred with Hamath of the tribe of Rechab. And Zabud let call for tables, and Solomon the king played at the chess with Habakkuk the son of the desert, and Solomon's men were of the white, and Habakkuk's of the black. And Habakkuk played without thought, as one that cares but little of the chess, so that in a brief space King Solomon had taken prisoner both his elephants, and a knight of the right hand, and a camel of the left, besides four of his foot soldiers, while Habakkuk had taken but one foot soldier of King Solomon. And King Solomon said within himself, What glory is it to win at the chess of a dog of the desert such as this? 
Doth the lightning make a boast of slaying the frog that croaketh in the marsh? I will contrive a combination and make an end of him. So he made a combination and took his captain. Then Habakkuk laid hold on one of his ebony foot soldiers and said, O oh, my lord King Solomon, the one merciful hath given thee dominion over all ghosts and afrits and jinn and myriads of the jinn, them that inhabit the houses of the fire and them that walk on the earth or creep within its bowels, them that dwell within the deep waters and them that fly upon the wings of the air. Yea, all them that durst disobey thy behests hast thou imprisoned against the day of judgment in vessels of copper sealed in lead with thine own seal and hast cast them into the sea of el -Kirker. Yet hath not the one merciful, to whom be glory, given thee lordship over these bits of ebony and ivory, that they should do thy will? For lo, when I set down this foot soldier on yonder next square, where will my lord the king be then? And Solomon looked at the tables, and behold, when his adversary should sit down the foot soldier, he was checkmated without redress. And when he understood that he was known of the son of the desert and had been defeated by him, a mighty wrath got hold of King Solomon, and the world was straightened upon him. And his forehead waxed dark as the night of retribution, and his eyes flashed thereunder as it were the burning of the two cities of the plain, and his voice was as the roaring of the fire wherewith they were consumed. And he leapt to his feet and would have drawn his sword to smite off the head of Habakkuk. But Habakkuk abode still and lifted up the ebony foot soldier in his right hand, and the king was as one stricken with a sudden palsy. And there came upon him a great whiteness and trembling, and his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth, and the sword dropped from his right hand. And Habakkuk said unto him, O oh, my lord King Solomon, where is the wisdom wherewith the one merciful hath gifted thee beyond all others of the sons of men? Behold now, these three times hast thou gone about to slay the servant of the living God. How is it that thou hast not known me? And as Solomon looked straightly at Habakkuk, the snow of his hair and his beard was melted away, and the manner of his garments were changed, and even while Solomon was yet marveling at the change, behold, it was the slave girl at Matha who held up the ebony foot soldier against the king. And the waters of forgetfulness were rolled back from the king's memory, and he said, Verily, I should have remembered and repented, for lo, this game is the very game, move for move, that I played with thee, O Admatha, when that time thou wert sent for to sing in the house of Bin Abinadab, my son. And Admatha said, O my lord King Solomon, of a truth this is even so. But where is the wisdom wherewith the one merciful hath gifted thee beyond all others of the children of men? How is it thou hast not known me? And as Solomon looked straightly at Admatha, her countenance and the manner of her garments were changed, and even while the king was yet marveling at the change, behold, it was Jerob bin Othniel who held up the ebony foot soldier against the king. And the things which had been were lifted above the waters of forgetfulness, and Solomon saw them even as they were. And he said, Verily, I should have remembered and repented, for lo, these two games are the very same, move for move and combination for combination, with the game I played aforetime with thee, O Jerob ben Othniel, when thou didst bear a message to Jehoshaphat, my remembrancer. And Jerob said, O oh, my lord King Solomon, of a truth this is even so, but where is the wisdom wherewith the one merciful hath gifted thee above all thy fellows? How is it that thou hast not known me? 
And as Solomon looked straightly at Jerob, his countenance and the manner of his garments were changed. And even while the king was yet marveling at the change, a glory as of the unspoken name lighted his face, and his hair was as the rays of the sun at noonday, and his raiment was as a flame of fire, and from his shoulders came forth wings, whereof every feather was as a rainbow after the storm. And the angel said, O King Solomon, where is the wisdom wherewith the one merciful hath gifted thee above thy brethren? Even yet thou hast not known me. And the angel still held up the ebony foot soldier against the king. And Solomon said, Verily, Long since should I have known thee and repented, O Azrael, angel of death, for none save the brother of the four who uphold the throne of God, to whom be glory, could have played this game at the chess that thou hast played against me, lo, these three times. And Azrael said, O King Solomon, may the one merciful have much mercy upon thee, for thou needest much. And he set down the ebony foot soldier, and King Solomon was dead. The best sentence in this story is, I am as one that resteth on his oar when the image of his oar is bent awry by reason of the water that is over it, so that he seeth not aright that which he seemeth to see. Although a close second is the bit where the beautiful girl has a mole on her face the color of the soil of Eden. This story is just a litany of absolutely incredible metaphors stacked one on top of the other. I didn't research all of them, but they are all something. They are not just flowery language. Like, the bit where his eyes are as the torches of them that seek for Tammuz on Lebanon is a reference to Tammuz, the consort of the Sumerian goddess Inanna, who, like Persephone and Inanna herself, spends half the year in the underworld of death, and then he's annually resurrected, and eventually he became the god Adonis, and his annual festival was celebrated in what is now Lebanon. Although Evans is probably here not directly referencing the Sumerian myth, but he's referencing the reference to it in book one of Milton's Paradise Lost. And then another a fleeting reference to Eblis the Braggart is a reference to the leading devil in the Quran, an invisible spirit who was too proud to worship God and who thus became father of the jinn. Anyway, there are dozens and dozens of references in this story to ancient religions, folklore, mythology, literature, and every one of them means something. It's absolutely incredible. So King Solomon was playing chess with death the whole time, right? He would encounter death in disguise on the way to some other destination and persuade him to pause for a game, and then he would lose the game, and then he would, of course, forget the encounter. I suppose the subtext is that Solomon's intuition eventually tells him that something is going on, that he is somehow deceived and he's not seeing clearly. And perhaps only someone as wise as Solomon would be able to perceive so much, although he still doesn't perceive the truth. Only when death comes to play him is everything eventually revealed. This story is masterfully written in that way. As it develops, we, the reader, come to understand more than Solomon about what's going on. And this, of course, builds suspense and makes us more interested in how things develop because we understand that the stakes are higher than Solomon knows. But the big reveal happens all at once for us and for him simultaneously, very suddenly. It's extremely interesting and very thought-provoking. By the way, forgive the rain squalls and things that are happening outside. I'm going to try to filter out some of this background noise, but it's probably still going to get through. So our author tonight, Sebastian Evans, seems like a really remarkable person. His father was a teacher and a clergyman, and he was taught by his father before going to university at Cambridge and graduating in 1857. He was somehow appointed the secretary of the Indian Reform Association, and in that capacity, he was actually the first person in England to become aware of the Indian Rebellion of 1857. That same year, he resigned from the Indian Reform Association and became the manager of the art department of a glassworks in Birmingham. 
So he kept that job for 10 years. He designed stained glass windows, including the famous stained glass depiction of the legend of Robin Hood that appeared at the International Exhibition of 1862 in London. So over time, as he's working as a stained glass designer, he had become more and more interested in politics. So in 1867, he left the glassworks to become the editor of a conservative newspaper. And the following year, he ran a failed campaign to represent Birmingham in the general election, but he also helped to form the National Union of Conservative Associations, today known as the National Conservative Convention. And he also got his law degree from Cambridge. So in 1870, he became a full-time barrister, and while conducting his legal practice, he also wrote short stories for various magazines. Wikipedia says that these stories had a tendency to the supernatural, and that he published in Longman's Magazine, among others. So this must be the period of time in which he wrote this particular story we're reading today. Then he stopped being an attorney and went back to being a newspaper editor, and he became increasingly conservative, eventually becoming a neo-Jacobite and seeking to restore the monarchy in England and put a Stuart on the throne. And this whole time he wrote and published poetry collections, and he translated verse and prose from medieval French, Latin, Greek, Italian. He also had multiple art exhibitions, including at the Royal Academy, for his work in oils, watercolors, graphite, etc., he is best known today for his 1898 High History of the Holy Grail, translated from 15th century French and illustrated by Edward Byrne Jones. What a wild resume. It is no wonder that this guy knows all these oblique references in ancient mythology in this story. He knows everything. It's weird that I can't find any of his other short stories, but I will continue to poke around. They must be out there somewhere. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a confession. Tonight's confession is that yesterday was my birthday, so I didn't post a story and I was just self-indulgent instead. I had a couple of things I really wanted to have happen by yesterday. One of them is that I wanted to reach a thousand subscribers. I'm so dang close, but I can't quite get there. And the other is that my old landlord still hasn't refunded my deposit, so I've hired an attorney who wrote him a strongly worded letter that gave him 14 days to pay up. And just by coincidence, my birthday was the 14th day. And unfortunately, what happened is that she got the strongly worded letter back saying that he isn't at that address anymore. So anyway, now I have to work a bit harder to find him and to get my money. Anyway, it would have been fantastic if either or both of those things had happened on my birthday. And I really did have my fingers crossed until the last minute. But... I recently read an article that said that we don't need to be optimistic or cynical. We can instead be, quote, hopefully skeptical. I think that's a fantastic term for the outlook that I actually strive to maintain most of the time. So I wasn't terribly disappointed when yesterday didn't fulfill all my hopes. All of those things will come to pass eventually. And frankly, my landlord and my lawyer and the universe don't care at all about my birthday. For them, it's just another day, and they all just keep ticking right on by. However, if you have enjoyed this story and you want to do one little thing for me, then send it to somebody you know who might like it. Sharing, liking, commenting all help other people find the channel, and they help me finally reach the stupid goal of a thousand subscribers. Thank you guys so much for all the support. I will see you in a few days.